Okay, so this evening it's going to be rather informal and short, hopefully. Um, not everyone here is a beginner and not everyone is unfamiliar with Bhante Bhandi, Vimala Ramsey or unfamiliar with the Dhammasukha Meditation Center. However, some people might not know very much about the center and about Bhante, so I wanted to give you a history so we could really appreciate what has been created here. Um, after I do that, um, Mark and I will do a short introduction about ourselves, and then I, I'll give you, I'll hand out some um, um, folders here for you, and then we'll just touch upon loving kindness meditation uh, for a short, brief period of time. So hopefully we'll get all that done in an hour and before it gets dark. So welcome to Dhamma Sukha Meditation Center. It is, it was a meditation center and a monastery, but since Bhante Vimala Ramsey passed away, being the monastic abbot here, it's no longer a monastery, but it is a meditation center. Um, even though he is gone, many of the traditions that we keep here are the traditions that he started as a monastic. And, um, yeah. So, and then Dhammasukha was built um, by a, a vision from Bhante. About 20 years ago, it, it got its start. And um, the vision that he had was for a monastery and a meditation center. He wanted to have a monastery for monastics to come and study and meditate and uh, have a place to be for a while. He also wanted to have a meditation center for lay people so that we could come and um, on retreat and um, get the blessing of the Dhamma and the blessing of his teaching. So, so this is a center that I, th that I think was built for renunciation because when the monastics come here, they have renounced their daily, um, their lay life. And when we come here, we renounce our daily um, activities and, and we take on a semi-monastic um, type of life and really uh, deepen our uh, study of the Dhamma, deepen our meditation and walk the Eightfold Path here. So, so that was the re renunciation. It's also built on the principle of generosity. When Bhante was in Asia for about 12 years, he was um, very deeply moved by the way that the Asian people um, treat their monastics. Uh, the monastics um, were um, supported by the generosity of the lay people and everything was done by donation. So when he came back to the United States in 1998, he also uh, wanted to bring that same principle of generosity to the meditation center. And the meditation center has been built completely from the generosity of donors, both in Asia, in Europe, in the United States. And when he started his vision in 2003, um, things grew organically. And when he had enough donations for a building, then he would build that building. Otherwise, um, he'd wait until enough donations came in. So we are continuing that tradition of generosity here. Um, Dhammasukha has no other 
source of income other than the generosity of the people that come here and meditate and um, get benefit from the Buddhist teaching and get benefit in their lives. So um, we leave it open for people when they come to, um, if they find that the teaching was valuable, to also practice the generosity that, that he envisioned. So um, let me give you a short um, bio of Bhante, um, which maybe some of you have not heard. He was born in 1946. And um, in the 1970s, late 60s and 70s, he went to college in San Diego. And his mother lived in San Diego. He became our neighbor in the early 70s. And the three of us, Mark and he and I, were lay people at that time, and Bonte and Mark were interested in um, consciousness expansion and meditation, and they um, wanted to go and try out Vipassana meditation. So I tagged along because I wanted to make sure Mark wasn't going to do something weird. <laughs> and so uh, the three of us started the, uh, Vipassana meditation as lay people. Our paths soon um, diverged. Um, Bhante moved to the Bay Area and he became more and more interested in a monastic life. Um, in the Bay Area he did some other um, Vipassana meditation and he found his spiritual father there, Usilananda, who as David said some of the ashes are in the um, stupa along with um, Bhante and Sister Kema. So then uh, Bhante wanted to go to Asia and really immerse himself in deep meditation and deep study. So Usilananda ordained him I think in 1996, at uh, 1986 I mean, at the age of 40. And then Bonte traveled to Asia. In 1988, he went to Yangon, and I think he was at the Mahasi Sayada Center there. He was there for a year. He, he studied and meditated with a teacher there, uh, getting interviews every day. And his daytime hours were 20 hours a day, either either going to Dhamma talks or meditating. So that he did that for a year. Then that was in '88. Um, a year later, the Burmese government uh, wanted all the foreigners to leave Burma. So Bonti went to Malaysia, and he um, studied metta meditation, loving-kindness meditation, for six months and again under a uh, very accomplished teacher. When they opened the doors again in uh, Myanmar in 1990, Bhante returned to Yangon and entered one of the, one of the Vipassana monasteries there and he uh, stayed there for two years. His day was 16 hours of meditation. Sometimes he would meditate seven to eight hours at a sit. He would have a daily interview and he was studying the Vasudhi Maga, which was the definitive and authoritative work for Bur Burmese monks. Now the Vasudhi Maga is a commentary on the Buddhist teaching, and it was written a thousand years after the Buddha. It was written by a Brahmin who was not a meditator. 
so it was somewhat removed from the original teachings. During those two years, Bhante uh, experienced many insights. He accomplished the 16 um, knowledges that um, are uh, to be accomplished in the Pasna meditation. And he was told that he, he had gone as far as anyone could go. He was somewhat disappointed and he was, he was rather confused about it because he felt that something was still missing, even though that he had gone as far as he could go. There was a missing piece, but he didn't know what it was. So he was disillusioned with, with the practice. He then moved to uh, Malaysia and he wanted to teach loving kindness. He felt that when people practiced loving kindness, they were a lot happier and they seemed to make good progress. So he uh, settled into teaching at a Theravada monastery in Kuala Lumpur. In 1996, his life changed dramatically. At that time, he was given a copy of the Majjhima Nikaya, which was um, translated into English by Bhikkhu Bodhi just the year before. He looked at the teaching there and he was very excited. Um, for the first time, he could read the teaching in English. Before that, if you wanted to have the original teaching, you had to know Pali and have to be really very well versed in Pali and to understand. So he took the Majjhima Nikaya and he requested to have a leave of absence from the monastery. And he, many, maybe some of you have heard his talks about how he went to a cave in Thailand and he shared it with a cobra and he was there for three months. There he studied the Nikaya and he practiced exactly the way that the Buddha taught the practice. And he was very keen to understand when the Buddha had said, this is how you train, then he paid attention and he trained the way that the writings said you should train. And I will talk about that tomorrow uh, when we talk more deeply about the practice. So doing that, he had phenomenal breakthroughs and he had an understanding that he hadn't had before. He went through the jhanas, he experienced nibbana, and he was very, very excited about his new findings of the teaching. So then in 1998, he returned to the United States and came to San Diego because that was where his mother was living. And we reestablished our acquaintance with him after 12 years of him being away. Um, however, he became our teacher. So, okay, so then, um, then he started traveling around the United States again, um, going to Washington, D.C. and going to Florida. And in Washington, D.C., he met Sister Kama. Sister Kama was looking for a teacher and she found Bonte because Sister Kama was somewhat psychic, so she, <laughs> she knew where to look. <laughs> and so she found Bonte and she became his disciple, so, disciple, so to speak. He became her teacher. Uh, eventually, Sister Kama, um, at that time she was a lay person, and eventually she took on the robes and she took 10 precepts. So she was a 10 preceptor nun. So the two of them um, worked together in order to bring the vision forward of, of making a monastery and a meditation center. 
and they came to Missouri because of some connections and um, they found this piece of land. They put out the word to their students that, um, that they're interested in starting the monastery here. So the donations came in to purchase the land and then the donations kept coming to build up the monastery. Sister Kema was very energetic and she did the um, scut work, so to speak, of, because Bonte was a monk, he couldn't do everything. So she, she did a lot of things that needed the worldly uh, presence. And being a 10 preceptor nun, she was able to do these things. Um, now, David, uh, was also a friend of Bonte's when he was a lay person in San Francisco. And um, he heard that Bonte had come back and he came to some retreats that Mark and I uh, organized in Joshua Tree, California. Actually, the first retreat we organized was in 1998. That was the first twin retreat and that was the retreat where the six R's were co uh, codified. So, um, so that was retreat number one. But since that time, we kept on um, organizing retreats and in, in California every spring. And so David started joining in uh, at the retreats. David started filming uh, Bunty's talks at the retreats. And, uh, Eventually, as he told you, that he came to live here after retiring from IT work. He came to live here and to lend his hand to um, developing the center in 2010. Um, David brought all of his skills and talent for IT to the center. And he is responsible, I think, for putting the word out into the, um, at, into the, what, what would you call that? The, IT, the internet, okay. into the world. You, I think without David, this, this uh, practice would not be as widely known as it is today because David um, has done all of the uh, editing of Bunty's talks, getting them on the internet. He has done the groups. He has done the work for the um, guided retreats on the internet and probably some other things that I don't know about. <laughs> lots and lots of IT. So, um, so, his, his talents have greatly um, spread the word. Um, and so David became the manager in 2010, and that freed up Sister Kema to go um, out in the world also and teach TWIM. So she went to Sri Lanka, she went to India, started a couple of small centers there, and she stayed in um, Asia primarily um, and never really came back to live here. Then Kirsten, she's, she told you how she came here, so you have Kirsten's story as well. Two other people that I need to mention are Jerry and Rose. Um, Jerry and Rose grew up with the center, <laughs> although they're adults. They um, they came here, uh, as she said, in 2006. So that was about three years after Bonte and sister came here. Jerry is a very skilled craftsman. Jerry is a skilled, um, he has many skills. He can do plumbing, he can do electrical, he can do construction, and he can even go on the internet and get a schematic of how to build a stupa. Yeah. <laughs> and he built, he and his assistant, Doug, yeah. built that stupa from the schematic on the internet. So I think that's 
quite a talent. Um, so, so Jerry is is the man that keeps everything running here. Um, Rose was a um, she went to culinary school in um, Jefferson at Jeff's Jefferson University in Missouri. So she has a culinary degree and she became the cook here. So I think that they real, really are um, angels to me, uh, keep it, keeping the place running because there is so much to do here. And you see their work and their love here. Um, so those are really the people that have um, brought this place to the, to the place it is now. So as you heard, um, Bonte passed away a year ago and it's uncanny, but Sister Kema passed away three months after Bonte. She was in Europe at the time, and she also had a chronic illness. Uh, so the founders are gone, and now the uh, meditation center is uh, run by David and Kirsten. I think the vision still stays the same as to um, give a teaching of the uh, to give the Buddhist teaching as close to the suttas as possible and to interpret them uh, with Bhante Vimala Ramsey's um, method of meditation. Uh, the Buddha, Mark likes to say this, but I'm going to take it away from you. <laughs> the Buddha told us what to do, but often he didn't tell us how to do it. So um, Bhante through his deep study and his deep knowledge really gave us a method of how to do it. And, um, uh, and I think that David is, is pretty much devoted to continuing that tradition. So there are monastics that come to the center and teach. These are monastics that studied under Bhante and there are his senior teacher, senior students that have taken up the call to pass on the knowledge that we have gotten from him and um, the, the road that we have traveled. And so I am very honored to be here as a guide uh, to give you the guidance that I know and also to um, um, teach the Dhamma in a way or share the Dhamma in a way that Bhante has taught us to do. Um, so I think that is, that is about Bhante. Um, now I'll, I'll just elaborate a little bit about myself and then Mark wants to say a few words. Mark and I started meditating with Bhante, as we said, 50 years ago, and we started with Vipassana. Um, and at first it was, you know, to relieve stress. <laughs> Isn't that what we all search for, how to relieve stress, how to relieve our suffering? And for a while it was very helpful. We would come home from work and for a half an hour we would sit and meditate on our breath and, um, and then have dinner. And it was like we started a new day. Then we would go on some retreats given by IMS and IMW and, and we learned about the Buddha's teachings. But then somewhere along the way it got kind of stale. And we'd, we weren't really making much progress in the meditation. So we were very fortunate and blessed that in 1998, Bhante showed up again in San Diego and he gave us his interpretation of the teaching 
and gave us a teaching as close to the suttas as possible. And we have been his disciples ever since. We've gone to retreats once or twice a year with him, um, and we've managed some retreats. And now I am endeavoring to pass on what I know. So um, then the rest of the time, and it'll be very brief, Many of you have already done um, TWIM, either here or have come on retreat or you've done online retreats and you're familiar with it. But a few of you have not done that. And um, for those people particularly who have not done loving kindness practice, uh, what I want to say tonight and this is only a partial um, instruction because I know you're tired and I don't want to just go into the full instruction. We're going to do that tomorrow. But the partial instruction is to really um, consider loving kindness and kind of contemplate loving kindness in what is loving kindness. Loving kindness can be um, holding a sukkah, where sukkah is so cuddly and, and just looks in your eyes and, and wants to be rubbed and your heart opens. Loving kindness can be, if any of you have children, uh, holding your child, looking at your child, the innocence of the child and how the child reaches out to you and your heart opens. Loving kindness can be as simple as seeing a little beetle on the ground with its leg, legs up in the air and you will go over and you just pick it up and flip it over and it stops suffering and just scurries off. Um, loving kindness can be little acts such as smiling at someone and asking them, well, how was your day? and really being interested, and your heart opens. Some people say they have difficulty with really feeling that feeling of loving kindness in their heart, w relating to people or relating to animals. And I can say that the heart can open also in nature if you go out in nature and you're at a viewpoint and you look out at a lovely scene and you just feel so good, um, you feel so peaceful, you feel a really pleasant feeling in your heart thinking, oh my, isn't this, isn't this just something very special? So for some people it's recalling um, a, an incident such as that where, where the heart opened and it wasn't necessarily because of a person or an animal. So tonight for the people particularly who have not um, contemplated loving kindness and who are coming to the retreat in order to really develop your loving kindness, spend some time um, feeling and thinking and remembering when your heart was feeling really open and you had a pleasant feeling in your chest, you had a warm feeling in your chest, and take that feeling and really be with it and radiate it to yourself. Just, just be with that feeling and let that feeling go throughout your body. Just go and radiate as far as it can. And then when, when, you, when you have that feeling there um, and that feeling starts to drift off, think of about some phrases, may I be happy. See if that feeling comes up again. May I be peaceful. May I be joyful. May I be free from suffering. Those are phrases that we give ourselves in order to generate that loving 
kindness in our chests for ourselves. There are, there are wise people who say that you have to have love for yourself in order to have love for other people. So it is part of the practice here to really find that love for ourselves and to really deepen that love for ourselves and to really radiate that love for ourselves. So if you have some time in, uh, tonight and, and you can reflect on loving kindness. Also, I'm going to give you some um, folders here. And as the week goes on, <clears throat> I'll add to the folder. But to begin with, the folder has um, a write-up on the six R's by Mark. And you could review that folder, the write-up about the six R's. And that is, you're going to hear about the six R's until you just wake up <laughs> in the middle of the night six r <laughs> It'll just go on and on day after day until it becomes part of you. So this is the beginning of the six R's uh, for those who have never encountered them before. And they are also written up in the book that you gave them, right, David? Those, the yeah. twin, the twin book. Twin and that, that each, of, each of them can have that, right? Yes. Yeah. So, so if you left your book in the, in the, uh, uh, dining hall, pick up your book and, and you can look at that as well. Um, otherwise, there's, uh, there's the um, weekly, the, the week in review of all the topics that we're going to cover and the suttas that we're going to cover, if you wanted to look at that. And um, we will add some other information as the week goes on. So I think I have said everything I want to say today. Tomorrow morning, our plan was that we'd come and do our precepts. Then David is going to do a guided meditation. Um, and we were going to have Bhante give us his um, introductory talk for an hour if the lights go on, right? If the lights don't go on, I'll have to give the introductory talk for an hour <laughs> or introductory talk. I have another trick up my sleeve. Oh, okay, you got something else going. Okay. So let's go to bed with that, with the thought in our hearts and minds the lights will go on during the night. <laughs> Maybe if all of us say that, they will, it, it'll come to fruition. Uh, so that's, that's the f thing that's going to happen tomorrow morning. Um, are there any questions? Okay. So let me just give you the folders and then you can be on your way. And for those people who are quite accomplished, um, uh, accomplished twimmers, uh, I encourage you to still start your practice with the loving kindness to yourself, um, at least for the next day or so, and radiating to your, uh, to your spiritual friend. And as you deepen into your practice, your mind will naturally go to the level that you were at when you were last practicing, and, and then you can just go on from there. But the first day or so, I just stay with, with the beginning instructions. Okay.